The purpose and meaning of my life is the refuge to and from I have is just revive and reawaken those thoughts in your own words. So as we um, continue our, cont our conversation about Buddha nature and the nature of the mind and how to work with the nature of the mind, it more and more becomes a discussion of emptiness. And um, I think that as we go into more and more conversations about emptiness, to realize that there is a very direct and accessible meaning to the emptiness of inherent existence that is something that we've all I think intuitively understood all of our lives, all of our lifetimes. And then there's a deeper level of it that becomes more um, maybe intellectual or cognitive or um, wordy or unfamiliar. And it can kind of be daunting and make us uh, reactive in a way that can make us either shut down and close off or get really agitated trying to get it all clear. And if that happens, I think just keep coming back to your intuitive, you know, organic, natural understanding that everything is interconnected and that everything exists related to context. You know that, you've always known that, that's, that's not a new knowledge. And that is um, the foundation that we start from to go more and more and more subtle. And so thinking that that is it is also a trap and oversimplistic and um, not the end of the story. But if you can kind of hang on to that, that knowledge of interdependence, that knowledge that everything exists related to its context, that will help you from feeling too lost if we get into vocabulary and concepts that are new. Okay, so um, emptiness is very simple and very complicated, both, <laughs> okay? And the reason we talk about it is by understanding it, we completely interrupt the momentum of our negative habits. By understanding emptiness, we stop suffering. 
By understanding emptiness, we stop hurting other people, hurting ourselves. It's cutting the root of confusion and the innate ignorance about our identity and ourselves and others and our relationship there. So it's an essential piece. So just because it can be daunting is not a, not a good reason to say I'm not going to look at that topic because it's actually a very logical science, physics, neuroscience agree sort of side of Buddhism that's not related to the woo-woo spiritual stuff that maybe you have to take on faith a bit longer. Emptiness is very directly related to um, scientific reality as well as more spiritual reality. So, so just really gently, we're going to um, look at this relationship between the mind, the clear light nature of the mind, and its emptiness, and how all of that is branded as Buddha nature or Buddha potential. So on page 63, we're continuing this reading from His Holiness, and um, that was edited and compiled by Venerable Tubden Chudren, a very senior nun in our tradition. So um, if we look at the bold heading that says a link between Sutra and Tantra, that's where we are on page 63. Okay. So um, as we talked about last week, this way of describing the Buddha nature as both the object, emptiness, and the subject, mind, is confirmed by the seventh Dalai Lama in his commentary on the pristine wisdom on the verge of transcendent sutra. Okay, so this is, a, this is just an important premise to become very clear on, otherwise we can't go any further, right? That Buddha nature is both the object, emptiness, and the subject, mind. Yeah, this is a really important point to be very clear on, that's what we're talking about. Okay, he explains that the pristine wisdom on the verge of transcendence refers to both the pristine wisdom realizing the ultimate nature as one approaches nirvana and the pristine wisdom realizing suchness or emptiness that is the heart of the practice that one must engage in at all times, including at the point of death. Okay. In his commentary, the seventh Dalai Lama quotes the sutra, if you realize the nature of your mind, it is wisdom. Therefore, cultivate thorough discrimination, not to seek Buddhahood elsewhere. So what is the nature of mind? He says that it has three characteristics. The nature of the mind that is devoid of all conceptual elaborations. It is empty of inherent existence. Since the ultimate nature of all phenomena is undifferentiable, the nature of that mind is all pervading. The nature is not polluted by any adventitious conceptualizations or afflictions. So these are some words that are maybe not conversational English. So it's totally understandable if you don't even know the words, let alone the meaning. Uh, native English speaking people also have the same problem. It's not like we use the word adventitious in conversation. All right, so um, don't feel lost or like your English is bad. This is, this is you know, specific English usage that's a little bit tricky. Um, when we talk about the first one, devoid of all conceptual elaborations, it means that the mind's nature is not its conceptualizations. The mind has conceptualizations. It has concepts and thoughts and ideas, but those things are not in and of themselves the nature of the mind. They spring forth from the innate ignorance. So even the positive ones like loving kindness and compassion are colored by a misunderstanding of truth, even though they're more positive and beneficial. Is that first one coming clear? Yeah, okay. So number two, since the ultimate nature of all phenomena is undifferentiable, the nature of that mind is all pervading. So the ultimate nature of all phenomena is that all phenomena are empty of inherent existence. And that emptiness is the same emptiness for everything. It's not a different emptiness for chairs than it is for people. Yeah, emptiness is the same emptiness no matter what you're relating it to. It has the same quality of the absence of inherent existence being a non-affirming negation, not implying anything in its place. So that's what's meant by undifferentiable. 
and the nature of that mind is all pervading. So though the mind at this point in our life is somewhat contained by our physicality, that is not the fundamental nature of mind to be sort of trapped by physicality. And we already have some experience of how perhaps the mind is not as related to the body as we were trained to believe when we learned about you know biology perhaps number three the nature is not polluted by any adventitious conceptualizations so to say not polluted it means that the fact that it has these additional thoughts ideas imaginings don't pierce into the fundamental nature of the mind so despite the mind having very strong conceptualization habits, those habits never enter into the fundamental essence. So it's always like water with pollution. The pollution looks like it's one with the water, but it never enters into the molecules of the water. Yeah, it's always removable. Or, or if you like something gentler, you could think, you know, like milk and water. If you pour milk and water together, you can't tell the difference between the water part and the milk part. It's all kind of cloudy and white, but through different sort of processes, you can separate them. They're not um, fundamentally intertwined, even when they're mixed. So this is true of the mind and its habits of conceptualization. I, yeah, okay, so this is just, you know, this should be slightly review in some way. These should ring some bells, but just to kind of, you know, get yourself clear on the basic premise. Um, he, being um, the seventh Dalai Lama, then turns to the Tathagata Garbha, the Buddha nature, saying that it exists in the mental continuum of each sentient being. So um, this is a point that might be self-evident or might not be, but if you think all sentient beings, all beings with mind have Buddha nature, it does so many things for your practice. You know, immediately there is respect and relationship. There is connection and affinity. There is some sort of uh, cherishing and valuing and an inability to discard. So if you think about the way propaganda works during wartime, Okay, think about the way propaganda works during world war time. I was thinking about some of those propaganda posters um, from the Vietnam War in America. The propaganda posters make the Vietnamese look simian, you know, they make them look less than human. And if you make them other and not human, then you can kill them. <laughs> but if they're like you, it becomes like impossible. You know, and so of course, if you actually met Vietnamese people, then to see them and then shoot them would be way harder than othering them and making them into cartoon figures in your head, which in a way is good news that if we realize our sameness and we recognize the sameness of ourselves and other humans and other sentient beings, it almost becomes impossible to hurt them. You know, we have to really force ourselves to, um, to go into a violent aspect, into a damaging aspect. We have to talk over the top of our Buddha nature in order to go ahead and do the wrong thing. But when we think about animals and insects, we're not as good at relating. We're not as good at seeing that they have Buddha nature, the same as my Buddha nature. It's just right now not expressing itself in a way that looks like there's ongoing transformation. You know, and that makes us able to other them and make them in the category of rubbish or interference or, you know, I'm just going to vacuum all the spiders up. I'm just going to wipe over all the ants because they're not really people. They don't really have mind and sentience and Buddha nature. They're other, they're rubbish. That's what our afflictions say to us. So when we say that the Tathagata Garbha, the Buddha nature, exists in the mental continuum of every sentient being, to, to then go on and harm sentient beings and still identify as a spiritual practitioner becomes really weird. You know, there, there becomes a cognitive dissonance and a, an uncomfortableness that is useful to say, how can I, this being, this being has potential and right now by harming it, I'm creating an unfortunate relationship. And in, in the future when we meet, there's going to be a lack of safety feeling. You know, and even if I only believe in one life only, what does it do to my mind and my mental habits to think that 
my convenience is more important than something else's life. You know, that's, that's really a tough pill to swallow when we think about the way in which we um, are careless about, you know, animals and insects and the environment in general to realize how many of our choices are based in not kill or be killed, not actual threat, but convenience. It's inconvenient for this being to be in my house, so I will kill it for my own convenience. I mean, we, we make a lot of choices from that place. And um, it should give us a little bit of a cringe of perhaps that's not living with integrity with my compassion. Perhaps that's something to examine. Even if you only believe in one life, what does it do to your mental atmosphere to have that kind of entitlement and that kind of superiority? You know, it's, it's just something interesting to explore, but the way, one of the many ways that Buddhists try to overcome that entitlement and that superiority is to remember that every single sentient being has a mind that can transform into perfection, just like ours. And there's nothing to say that that little cockroach might not get there quicker. It might be that the habits in its mental continuum are actually rich and alive and right now not able to take the next step because of the limitations of its physicality. But in its next life, it's close to an amazing transformation. And it could even help us become enlightened if we maintained a good relationship and karmic connection there. But if we harm it, then we're making a problematic relationship and it might be harder to progress together in the future. So it's, it's interesting things to explore. You have to sit with it as an individual of what, what version of this resonates with you. But the idea that often we are careless and you know, dismissive of life purely from a place of convenience is an important thing to sit with because it relates to how we abuse the environment, doesn't it? Yeah, so many of our choices that are environmentally unethical aren't, I need this in order to survive. They are, I need this because it's convenient. You know, so, so that piece, I think, is universally relatable and all of us are trying to work on as best as we can. But to give it fuel, just, you know, what are the things that engender respect for other beings? Yeah, and living with respect for other beings makes you feel more connected and more, I think, expansive related to your own relationship with these beings. So, you know, a bug comes into your house, it's not something to be feared, you know, it becomes something that this is like me, you know, and it's what's going to touch your heart, you know, because living with Othering in all of its forms is what increases our anxiety and tension in daily life. Yeah, so if you see a bug and you're tense in response to it, you've given yourself tension, haven't you? And now that being is under threat because of the anxiety you've given yourself. You know, so now you're harming both of you by your projections. It seems so simple and so ordinary to use an insect example, but this is how we are with other people all the time. By othering them, we create fear. Through that fear, we create all sorts of negative states of mind. If there's an immediate affinity feeling of you are the same as me at this fundamental level, there is relief and relaxation and connection and possibilities. So this one line seems very simple, saying that it exists in the mental continuum of every sentient being, but there's, there's a lot of directions that you can go with touching the truth of it. Uh, what do you think? Can you un un explain why is the heading of this, no, the, this chapter is linked between Sutra and Tantra? What does it We haven't does gotten there yet. <laughs> We're only in like the, first, the, second, uh, the okay. second paragraph. Yeah, okay, but now we are reading it, so what does it mean, link between Sutra and Tantra? <laughs> Do you have this um, expression in Hebrew, wait for it, wait for it? <laughs> it's <Okay>. coming, <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> yeah, but I'm glad that you're intrigued. <laughs> I'm glad that you're intrigued. Okay, so that's perhaps your very polite way of saying, move on, so let's move on. Um, Tathagata Garba refers to three factors, all right? So Tathagata Garbha, don't be thrown. This just means Buddha nature, Buddha potential, okay? So when you read that, hear that. 
So number one, the factor that allows for the Buddha's awakened activity to interact with sentient beings. The key word being interact. This factor is called the essence or seed of Buddhahood because it allows for sentient beings to enjoy and benefit from the Buddha's awakening activities, which are the fruits of their awakening. Okay. So we're just talking about characteristics or aspects of this Buddha nature, okay? So then over the page, it is the aspect of the mind that is receptive and has the capacity to receive the Buddha's various awakening activities and influence. This is the potency that exists in sentient beings that allows for Buddha's awakening activity to interact with sentient beings and stimulate their progress on the path. Okay, so one aspect of Buddha nature is the ability to both be receptive and to engage with the receptivity in others. Right, the ability to have an influence, basically. Number two, the sphere of reality, namely the mind's emptiness of inherent existence. This factor is the emptiness of the mind that is not free from defilements. It is called the essence of Buddhahood because the nature of the Buddha's Dharmakaya and the nature of sentient beings' mind are the same in terms of not being inherently polluted by afflictions. In terms of the mind being empty of existing from its own side, there is no difference between a Buddha and a sentient being. In that way, sentient beings share the Buddha's nature. So this is a point we've talked about before, but is it clear that the emptiness of your mind and the emptiness of a Buddha's mind is the same emptiness? You're the same in that emptiness. And that one aspect of the Buddha body, the, <clears throat> the Swabhavik Kakaya, the nature truth body, and the fact of your mind's own emptiness, there is something almost identical about those two. It's just that the rest of the mind has developed. So that means that that aspect of the emptiness of the mind is now able to be a Dharmakaya, whereas for us it isn't yet. But it won't need any additional transformation. The rest of the mind needs transformation and then that will then become something that releases us from suffering. Okay, that's two. <laughs> okay, three. The factor that is the seed that serves as the basis for the actualization of the three Buddha bodies. So the factor that is the seed that serves as the basis for the actualization of the three Buddha bodies. Okay, so we say three Buddha bodies when we talk um, Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, Nirmanakaya. We talk four Buddha bodies when we divide the Dharmakaya into the two versions, the two types of the Dharmakaya. So when you hear two Buddha bodies, three Buddha bodies, four Buddha bodies, it's all actually talking about the same thing. That, that, are, that is related to emptiness and that is related to the method side. So it, there can be these kind of divisions and re-divisions and try not to get thrown. Um, sometimes it helps to look at that, that chart so that you know it's being um, indicated. Yeah, so I'll just pull it up for a second so you can be um, clear. So in the gray, there is impermanent and permanent aspects of the mind, but above that is a heading which is important, that which must be developed through purification and actualization, that which exists without effort, right? So that which exists without effort is the permanent, the naturally abiding, the truth body that will lead to the Swabhavik Akaya, the nature truth body, okay? All of the rest of it relies on development, whether development on the method side or development on the wisdom side. So, um, so this chart has come up a number of times and, and hopefully it's eventually becoming clear. But when they say the three Buddha bodies, they're talking about, the, they're talking about emanation body, enjoyment body, truth body, or Nirmanakaya, Sambhogakaya, Dharmakaya as one big um, umbrella term rather than its subdivisions into wisdom truth body and nature truth body. Okay, so the way things are divided and redivided and redivided, are, are you getting clear or is anybody lost? Uh, what is the benefit of this uh, revision and talking about it in this way of, of different bodies? Um, in, intuitively, what is your guess? Intuitively, what's your guess? <laughs> <laughs> 
for me, it's just ways to preoccupy the mind with this with this study. <laughs> I mean, as as it as it gets more and more detailed, then maybe it's, you need to absorb to be absorbed in it more and more. I don't know, but I I guess there are other more substantial reasons. So I'm asking. All right. Um, so um, now I have the sound of music stuck in my head. You know, let's go back to the very beginning, a very good place to start. <laughs> Julie Andrews has appeared in my mind's eye. Um, so the, the premise is the goal is Buddhahood. Okay. So the, if the goal is Buddhahood, what is Buddhahood? That which has been completely dispelled of all suffering and all negative states of mind that which is positive and has been fully developed. We want a fully developed mind that no longer suffers and causes trouble. That's the premise, okay, right? So what is that in terms of experience and in terms of the finished product? It is a mind that is able to be of benefit to oneself and a mind that is able to be of benefit to others. The way in which it's of benefit to itself has specific elements. The way that it's of benefit to others has specific elements. So you want to ask yourself then, what are the causes for those elements? And what are the results of them? Yeah. So you could say in general, Buddha, I would like to be Buddha and just have one category, Buddha, that's what I will be when I work on myself and kind of leave it at that. But knowing that alone does not help you start step one, step two, step three to actually undergo that transformation or we would already be Buddhas, right? Liking the idea of transformation is not enough to transform you. Having hope that transformation is possible is not enough to link you there. You need to understand cause and effect. You need to understand what currently blocks transformation, right? But also we need to understand what are the things that not only touch our current abilities and qualities, but can expand them. So it's always twofold. Yeah, which is why we started the semester with basis, path, and result. When we looked at the basis, the two truths, relative truth and ultimate truth, then because that being the state of affairs of reality, we have two ways of practice. Practice related to wisdom and practice related to method. Because of those two practices, we have two results. And those two results are a body of a Buddha related to the wisdom side and a body of the Buddha related to the method side. But those two bodies themselves have subdivisions related to practice and related to impact. You know, so, so it's kind of this process of, you know, you start very simple and then you need to elaborate how that came about. Once you've understood how that came about, you can go back to the simple idea and now it has more richness, context and connection. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, if you're never going to practice, that's okay. But knowing kind of what is the point of the effort we put in, I think gives you more of a sense of why it's meaningful and necessary. You know, when we ask ourselves, what makes us suffer? And we realize what makes us suffer is a misunderstanding of our own identity and our own relationship to others. That's a very universal concept, but the specifics of it in Buddhism are a little bit unique. Do you agree? So then if you think, okay, so what are the specifics in Buddhism? Um, what is this idea of emptiness and how does that help free me from suffering? And what would final freedom be? It's an interesting thing to explore. Whether you believe it or not is another kind of category, but just kind of exploring how it might be the case can bring something into your daily life experience, yeah? And then you ask yourself, do I want to be a benefit to others? Yes, obviously, or I wouldn't do the work that I do. Can I be of benefit to others? Is what I'm doing helpful? Can it be more helpful? What is, it, what is health for? To what end do I want people to be mentally healthy and physically healthy? To what end? So they just keep going through the same old you know, life having babies dying, life having babies dying infinitely like animals, to what end, you know? And 
maybe that's life's rich pageant and maybe we love every step of that or maybe that we can love every step of that and look at something deeper and something more profound that is actually a stable happiness that we have some control over and that we can bring out in others and that would be incredibly powerful and people could live any of any kind of way that they want to live as a surface condition for that but underneath the surface would be access to joy at any point do we want that for other people of course we do how do we get that we need to understand ourselves and make ourselves the guinea pig you know make ourselves the experiment to see if it's even possible do you know because who else do we really know this well <laughs> We might not even know ourselves that well, but we know ourselves the best out of anyone else. So if we apply these techniques and we say, all right, what if I just walk around the day thinking anyone who offends me, anything I'm offended by does not exist from its own side, because if it did, I would always be offended that way. And everyone would be offended in exactly the same way whenever they met, met with it. Okay, let's just walk around thinking that for a day and see what happens to my relationships. And then you realize that was quite a nice day, really. I wasn't stressed out, I wasn't provoked, I wasn't irritated, and what's more, I felt affection for my fellow man. Hmm, what if I did that all the time? What if that became a stable way of thinking continuously? Would that have a greater and greater impact? I'm guessing yes, let's have a go, you know? So uh, this is what I mean by when we get into the technical stuff, you can get a bit daunted and a bit reactive and, um, Laziness can get engaged where we think, I'm a good enough person, I'm a happy enough person, I'm an effective enough person, why do I need to learn all these lists? What is the point of all this? And you can sort of pull your hair out and be annoyed. Um, allow that, feel that, know it, and then say, would my life be richer and better if I could do more? It, would my life be richer and better if I knew myself better? You know, and when I'm on my deathbed, what will my regrets be? Well, I think, you know, I wish I hadn't studied as much as I had. I wish I'd really watched a lot more television. And I wish that I'd really had more arguments. And I wish that I'd polluted the environment a lot more. You know, that's so why is that going to be our deathbed regret? You know, I wish I'd lost my temper at my children a lot more often and really scolded them and made them feel bad about themselves, kind of in a more orchestrated way. Yeah. You know, so, so come back to that, right? What is the point of all this techniques for transformation? Why? We want happiness for ourselves and others. And we believe that more happiness is possible, more health is possible. Does it help? Is it, do you see the relationship between these ideas and this very, you know, funny chart? <laughs> Just, you know, just kind of explore it and you don't have to take it on, but um, just kind of knowing that our approach to study is as important as what we study. Our approach to practice is as important as what we practice um, because we're bringing the same mind to every content. You know, so then you ask yourself, who am I as a student? Um, what makes me reactive? What makes me engaged? What makes me feel I don't know, overwhelmed and what makes me feel intrigued? And why is it some days I feel really um, open and curious and okay with confusion and some days confusion upsets me and makes me reactive? Never mind the content, right? Never mind the content, just who am I as a student is a very important place to explore because the more we can become students of life then anything that we're meeting, we're gonna find really enriching and enjoyable. And when we find confusion, we're not going to take it so personally as like an ego trip of why don't I understand I'm stupid or it's stupid or they're stupid and you won't go into those traps. You'll just think, oh, I don't know that yet. That's interesting. Yeah. So your approach to study is as important as what you study. Your approach to practice is as important as what you practice. Uh, I, hope, I hope that you agree, but even if you don't, that's okay. <laughs> I'm going to keep talking anyway. All right, yeah. So these three factors, what they're really saying here is that um, when we talk about Buddha nature, we're talking about kind of like dormant, latent abilities that we have. But also we're talking about abilities that are already developing and naming them kind of brings them some life. 
Okay, so, so just kind of, you know, sit with those three, but when we jump down um, to number three again, the factor that is the seed that serves as the basis for the actualization of the three Buddha bodies, the three Buddha bodies in this context, enjoyment body, emanation body, and truth body, right? Nirmanakaya, Sambhogakaya, Dharmakaya. This factor is called the essence of Buddhahood because it is the cause because from this cause, the resultant three Buddha bodies emerge. This is the subject clear light mind described in the third turning of the wheel, which transforms into the three Buddha bodies. Usually a seed is an abstract composite, but in this case, it refers to a mind. Here, the Tathagata Garbha is a conditioned phenomena the clear light mind that will become a Buddha's mind. This clear light mind has existed beginninglessly, will continue endlessly, and is the basis of the emptiness of the mind. Okay, this third factor. So why is it called clear light? Clear light implies that the actual nature of the mind is undefiled. The stains that presently cover the mind are adventitious or extra additional. They have not entered into the nature of the mind and are not an inherent part of the clear light mind. Okay, so in Minds and Mental Factors, you learned that mind is clear and knowing. Yeah, and in Seven Types of Awareness, you understood that mind is clear and knowing. Um, and then what you talk about is the main minds and the mental factors. The main minds being what kind of observe the generality, the mental factors, what engages and moves the mind and has experience. So in Sutra, we talk very much about the main mental consciousness or the main mental mind. There are six main minds, right? Ear main mind, nose main mind, etc. But the mental main mind is kind of the place of transformation. And the mental factors in its retinue are what we want to use during med meditation to develop our minds into better qualities. In Tantra, we talk more about the clear light nature of mind. So not the mind being clear and knowing, but it having this aspect of like luminosity or illumination. Um, we're talking more about the experiential quality of the fundamental mind, as opposed to just kind of characteristics to know about it. So it's going more from, um, I guess, defining and labeling to more the experiential and the deeper sense of it. So the fundamental mind, the clear light mind, is the way the main mental consciousness is described in Tantra, and it's slightly more subtle, the way it's talked about in Tantra. And um, despite not necessarily being tantric practitioners, we use the tantric view in Tibetan Buddhism most often. And there's a lot of blending and crossover between the presentation in minds and mental factors and seven types of awareness and the subtler view in Tantra. And they get woven together so much so that you might not even realize the difference. Um, but know that when you hear clear light mind, we're talking about something slightly more subtle, the fundamental mind. And it's, it's, a, it's a more subtle conversation than just main mental consciousness. Okay, so this fundamental clear light mind is present at the time of death and it's present in a slightly coarser form during sleep, etc. And this clear light nature of the mind is something that is accessible through meditation, not just through the natural processes of the dissolutions at death. So clear light as opposed to primary principle consciousness or mental main mind. Okay, so clear light more related to the tantric presentation, primary principle consciousness more related to the sutra presentation. At our level in our conversation, they wind up being basically the same conversation, but know that there's a subtle distinction and more on that as it develops. So this clear light section, this comes from His Holiness's book, Sleeping, Dreaming, and Dying, an Exploration of Consciousness. And um, if you're curious about this topic, it's a really amazing book because it is a dialogue with various scientists as well. So um, it's a really excellent book. 
So His Holiness says, the subtle appearance that occurs when the vital energies have become absorbed into the central channel, right? Already we're having a conversation that we don't usually have. The subtle appearance that occurs when the vital energies have become absorbed into the central channel. What, right? That should make you go, wait, what? What are we talking about? And we're talking about the fundamental mind and the wind that it rides on. So this is unique to Tantra. We don't really talk about what the mind rides on in Sutra, which is um, the vital energy or um, the very subtle wind, not like blowing wind, but the very subtle wind. Um, it's like uh, the consciousness is the rider and the wind is the horse and they go together. It's a bit like if you think about your right hand, now consciousness is in your right hand and you have right hand awareness. But before you were thinking about it as actively, it might not have moved there in such a direct experiential way. Though the hand was pervaded by consciousness, you're not having so much of a experience of it until you think of it. So by thinking of it, the mind is able to then travel to that place, you know, a bit like, you know, horse traveling to a place. So the subtle appearance, the clear light appearance, you know, and it's not like visual, but it's as if visual. The clear light appearance occurs when all of the energies, which right now are all throughout the body, a bit like the nervous system or a bit the way uh, Chinese medicine would describe the qi, is now, right now, it's all over the body. But at death, it all absorbs into the central channel. And the vital energies become absorbed in this way at several junctures, most notably at sleep and death or in tantric meditation. As the energies become absorbed into the central channel, the mind goes through the eightfold stages of disillusion, including a series of appearances culminating with the clear light itself. So it's saying that as the mind withdraws from the elements, there is an impression that comes to our mind. So this, you know, this process where um, we say absorptions or disillusions, what really is being discussed is that the mind is letting go of its relationship with the body and the physical world. And then coarser levels of consciousness until all that is left is the most fundamental mind, which is where the karmic seeds ride or live. Okay. So when the earth element of the body, all the heaviness and weight and bones and solid aspects that are under the category of earth no longer support consciousness like at death, or when consciousness withdraws from them, like during sleep, then you have an appearance of a mirage. That's the natural result of that withdrawal process. It's not something you have to fabricate, but at our level, we rehearse it so that it doesn't shock and surprise us at death. And at death, we can actually use that mind and realize its emptiness. Yeah. So, you know, it withdraws from earth. You have a vision of mirage. It withdraws from, you know, all the different elements, you know, water, fire, wind, consciousness, coarser consciousness until the subtlest consciousness. And when the clear light dawns, as it says here, the experience of the clear light, which is said to be like a clear cloudless autumn sky just before dawn, represents the mind at its subtlest and awareness of it is called the natural clear light. When the practitioner maintains awareness of it, she has realized the fundamental nature of mind itself in that the clear light is the subtle basis for all other mental content. Okay, so that is all highlighted on purpose. Although extremely subtle, the clear light of sleep is not as subtle as the clear light of death. Because the vital energies do not become completely absorbed into the central channel upon falling asleep. At death, however, the energies do become completely absorbed. And for this reason, the clear light that appears at death is called the basic clear light or primordial clear light, for it is the mind in its subtlest and most fundamental state. Okay, so that arises naturally, and then what we're training and doing is seeing it as emptiness. Okay. So that's, and then, you know, you just dump down and then you've got a review of primary principle consciousness as you learned with Venerable Sangha Kadro, right? The main cognition posited by means of apprehending the entity of its object. 
synonymous with main mind. It is one of the two divisions of mind, the other being mental factors. So this concept of clear light, you know, it's got a lot of elements, but what we're really looking at is when the fundamental mind manifests, we need to train in recognizing it and then seeing that it's empty. So it'll, it'll appear and it has appeared over all of our lifetimes and lives and all of the times that the winds have absorbed. It appears, but we don't, eat, we don't recognize it and we don't see that it's empty of inherent existence. So those are the two additional elements that we need in order to, as if access and develop our Buddha nature. Yeah, so there's a natural arising, but then there needs to be a recognition and a development for us to actually progress with that fact. Continuing on, as Maitreya said, this clear and luminous nature of mind is as immutable as space. It is not afflicted by desire and so on. The adventitious defilements that spring from false conceptions. The clear light mind is not permanent, but the fact that the afflictions are adventitious, adventitious does not change. The sense the clear light mind being a continuity, nothing new is created at awakening. The obscurations and defilements have simply been eradicated. At this point, this mind, which has existed from beginningless time and whose nature is undefiled, becomes the omniscient mind. Because the seventh Dalai Lama is ostensibly speaking in terms of sutra, the Buddha nature he speaks of is this clear light mind described in Sutrayana. Looking deeper, I believe that he's actually referring to the fundamental innate clear light mind that has been present in sentient beings since beginningless time and goes on endlessly. The continuity of this mind will attain awakening. Open the page. Because a clear exposition of the fundamental innate clear light mind that acts as the seed of the three Buddha bodies is not found in Sutra, a practitioner must seek it in Tantra, especially in highest yoga Tantra, which contains an extensive explanation of the fundamental innate clear light mind that has existed beginninglessly and continues on until awakening. Without saying it directly, the seventh Dalai Lama is directing us to the tantric explanation of the innate clear light mind. In this way, the sequence of the three turnings of the Dharma wheel leads us from the basic teachings of the four truths to an in-depth explanation of the third and fourth truths, and then eventually to highest Yogi Tantra. Zogchen and Mahamudra usually refer to a subtle mind, Rigpa, or the clear light mind, as the Buddha nature. Among Galukpas, us, in Sutrayana, Buddha nature is usually discussed from the perspective of the ornament of clear realization, where it refers to the emptiness of the mind, not to the subtlest clear light mind itself, as Tantra speaks of it. However, here, commenting on a sutra, the seventh Dalai Lama, who is a traditional Galupa, also describes the Buddha nature in a way similar to that of Dzogchen and Mahamudra.
So Dzogchen and Mahamudra have slightly different meanings depending on which school of Tibetan Buddhism you're looking at. But what's being discussed here is um, similar to the death meditation. You're meditating on the nature of mind, but the subtlest nature of mind, and trying to marry that with your understanding of emptiness. So we've already done a lot of meditations on the clear light nature of the mind, the clarity of the mind, the continuity of the mind, the spaciousness of the mind, just kind of getting to know how the mind works by seeing that there is also there is always like a reflective expansive spacious aspect and there's always a moving changing you know deciding experiencing aspect and those are always happening simultaneously like the sky and the clouds you know so we know that right we know that through meditation and we know that through study even if when we do that meditation we're not totally sure what's happening or what we're connecting to if you bring your mind back to those clarity of mind meditations, you know, at first you're just letting the mind do what it does while staying focused on the breath. Yeah. And then you let go of focusing on the breath and try to stay clear and aware of the movement of the mind without getting hooked into any particular train of thought, you know, like you were watching clouds go by and you do that for a while trying to stay awake and spacious without engaging with every cloud. Yes. And then once you're kind of used to that, you pull back into the spacious blue or the clarity of the mind that is also there at the same time as clouds. And now you're kind of ignoring the clouds. It's not like you're pushing them away or saying that they're unimportant. You're just choosing to shift emphasis from clouds to sky. Yeah, so we've, we've done that before and we, we will do it again. And it's very useful just for settling the mind and relaxing the mind just in an everyday way. It's a really powerful meditation to do. In Dzogchen and Mahamudra, in our tradition, we then go on to marry that with our understanding of emptiness. So you take, you know, the, the mind, the main mind, the clear, expansive blue sky, and then you marry that with it in no way exists from its own side in and of itself, by way of its own character. Yeah, so sometimes you're meditating on emptiness, sometimes you're meditating on the clarity of the mind, but here you're bringing them together as one meditation. So that's why it's helpful to understand the two concepts separately, conversationally, experientially, before trying to bring them together. But, you know, Lamy Yeshi had very, very simple ways of explaining this meditation and not even going into the philosophy underneath or behind it. So um, the book that I gave you, um, Ego Attachment and Liberation, that we haven't looked at yet, but is um, got kind of like a blue and turquoise cover. Do you guys remember that book in your pile of books that was given to you a couple months ago? Um, there's a, a nice meditation that's moving towards Mahamudra meditation that, um, that I'll direct you to for your Wednesday meditation. Yeah, the one that Karina is holding up. So I'll give you the page numbers and a recording of it for your Wednesday meditation. But just, you know, it's easy to be daunted by all of the philosophy underneath the techniques, but the techniques themselves are actually not that hard to understand. It's just that only knowing the very bare bones basics of the techniques, you're only going to be able to go a certain level of depth and there might be some mistakes and pitfalls that can start to come in. So the reason we go into the depth and the philosophy underneath them rather than just do it is to try to avoid some of those mistakes that can happen um, because of not knowing the background. So, um, so that's what your Wednesday meditation will be. Um, are there any questions about this section? So yeah, yeah, right on. I would like to refer uh, with my question to the fourth uh, line uh, when it is said uh, the fundamental innate clear light mind that has existed beginninglessly and continues on until awakening. And what's up after awakening? Then instead of um, innate clear light mind, you have innate clear, you have clear light mind that has been developed into Buddhahood. Hmm. Okay. Yep. So um, 
to say continues on until awakening could sound like the continuum ends at Buddhahood, and that's not what's being said. It's saying that there's that naturally present clear light mind, the kind of raw gold experience, and it continues until you're a Buddha, but once you're a Buddha, now it's fully formed. Yeah, so it's not like it ends, it's that it's transformed now. Yeah, yeah other thoughts or questions? And then uh, it is permanent? At that stage, it will be permanent? Um, it depends who you ask. <laughs> um, your, your happiness will be um, not transitory, and your abilities will not be transitory, but there's an argument for there being changeability and how that manifests. There's, there's an argument to be made there. But um, yeah, at that point, you no longer have ups and downs, <laughs> you know, you just have continuous happiness. That's not to say you have kind of identical experience because still you're aware of relative truth. Um, the difference between um, like a 10th level bodhisattva who's on the very edge before becoming a Buddha and a complete Buddha is that um, a Buddha is able to see relative truth and ultimate truth simultaneously rather than alternating. Yonten, can you say what, why do they write there, the clear light uh, mind is not permanent? Yeah, because it changes moment to moment. Yeah, the clear light mind changes moment to moment. The emptiness of it is permanent, but what that emptiness is related to is impermanent. You know, so, so to make it really simple, okay, so like this bottle is empty of water, right? And that empty, the, the like being empty of water is not changing moment to moment. But it's not um, like indefinite because if I fill it up with water, now, the, now that has been destroyed. Yeah, so it's no longer empty of water once there's water in it. But while it's empty, that fact of its emptiness isn't undergoing momentary change. Does that make sense? But so the mind, that... the mind changes moment to moment, but the fact that that is lacking inherent existence is a permanent thing. That doesn't change. But we said that nothing uh, that uh, is um, no addition, no mental addition is penetrating uh, the clear light mind fundamentally. So what do you mean that it changes changes from moment to moment in what way? One moment of clear light gives rise to the next moment of clear light, which gives rise to the next moment of clear light. If you were to look at the, you know, the vast blue sky, would you say that it's static, unchanging, permanent? You wouldn't, but that clear, that clear, clean blue light is still undergoing momentary change, though it has a similar aspect each second. So just, just because the clear light mind has a similar aspect, it doesn't mean that that is an unchanging thing. So it's, at, uh, it's related to the temporal aspect of, t of time passing and it being um, new uh, uh, every, min every moment, something like that? Yeah, new but related. Not the, not same, the same mind... Uh, Continuously, statically. Yeah, new moment to moment, but related to the moment before. You know, it's not like it comes into being and then comes into being. It comes into me being related to the previous moment of being, you know, in an unbroken continuity like a river, you know. And like a river, it's carrying, you know, various debris and seeds, right, which right now color it, but can be removed and the river remains. That makes sense. <laughs> so, you know, sit with it. Um, <laughs> we'll take a minute and just think all of these thoughts, may they go towards the understanding of and awakening of and development of our fullest potential so that we can be of most benefit to both self and others.
Thanks guys, uh, see you at 8pm. Um,